Hi, good morning and welcome to Power Breakfast in the Mumbai News Center. I'm Pavitra Parekh and with me is Nigel D'Souza. Now we're in the middle of an important week globally. US-Iran tensions continue to remain in focus as President Trump has now imposed fresh sanctions on Iran. Now we're also just a few days away from the G20 meet that could tell us how the US-China trade dispute will pan out. So let's see how our own markets fare amidst all of this news. Absolutely, Pavitra. Very good morning, first of all. And a couple of uh, domestic factors as well. You cover the factors that we're looking at in terms of the global markets. Well, uh, you know, local factors would be the monsoon. You know, we're hoping that uh, that doesn't really spoil things out there because we've had so many good monsoons. Hoping this one as well is more or less, uh, you know, it get, catches up in the next couple of months. And besides that, we have the crucial FNO expiry as well. So things are likely to get quite volatile. We'll talk about that and more. First up, we're running you through all the top stories early this morning. Investors are cautious ahead of the G20 meeting this weekend where meetings of President Trump and Xi could make or break their trade dispute. Asian markets are subdued while Wall Street ends mixed. These measures represent a strong and proportionate response to Iran's increasingly provocative actions. How can we start a dialogue with somebody whose primary uh, preoccupation uh, is, is to put more sanctions on, on Iran? The U.S. turns the heat on Iran with fresh sanctions against its leadership. This after Tehran downed a U.S. drone last week. Brent falls to hover around the $64 a barrel mark. And the monsoon has covered almost half the country, but rainfall has been 37% below normal so far this month. The Met Department believes the conditions are favourable for the monsoon to advance, but private forecaster SkyMet warns that the rainfall could be subdued for the next two weeks. And on the show ahead, we discuss the, sex, uh, the success of Fevi Call with the three P's at Pidilite, Parekh, Pandey and Puri, as they tell us the secret behind Fevi Call Ka Jor. Well, Asian markets, they have opened up mixed early this morning. Investors, they are awaiting the trump Xi meeting at the G20 summit. That's scheduled later this week. But for starters, the Nikkei, that was under some pressure. That, in fact, it's uh, trading with a wee bit of a cut. The yen continues to struggle, you know, strengthen. So that is some safe haven buying that we're seeing on the yen. Now it's moved all the way to around 107 odd mark. So strength being seen on the yen, not great news for the equity market out there. But besides the Nikkei, the other few markets are trading with some green. So the Kospi is up three tenths of a percent. The Straits as well. The first stick was in the green. That was up close to around two tenths of a percent. And the Taiwanese index as flat as can be. Yesterday, the Nifty did end in the red, but this morning it's suggesting maybe at least for starters, we should start off with a gain of around 15 to around 20 points. The start has been more or less okay. The problem is in today and what happens towards the end of the trading session, but the bulls, they'll take some green just to kick start trade. All right, so let's also take a look at the U.S. markets now. Major indices ended lower, though the Dow did manage to see some amount of gain. The broader markets were dragged lower after President Donald Trump announced some fresh sanctions on Iran. Now, investors are also looking ahead to the key meeting between President Donald Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping at this week's G20 summit. CNBC's Eric Chemi now gets us a wrap of all of the action on Wall Street. Eric. U.S. stocks finishing the day mixed, the Dow adding eight points, closing just short of a new record. The S&P off by five and the Nasdaq down 26. President Trump signing an executive order to increase health care transparency. The order will pressure insurers, doctors and other health care providers to disclose more information about pricing. Hospitals will now be required to provide negotiated rates and out-of-pocket costs to patients before their procedures take place. Meanwhile, 19 billionaires signing a bipartisan letter asking the Trump administration and 2020 presidential candidates to support a tax on America's wealthiest households. The signees, who include George Soros and Abigail Disney, argue the tax would help tackle climate change, improve public health, and grow the economy. And Disney Pixar's highly anticipated Toy Story 4 hauling in $118 million during its U.S. debut. That's the highest weekend premiere of any Toy Story film. But despite being the third highest debut of 2019, those box office figures still fell short of expectations. All right. Thanks a lot for taking us through all of that action from the U.S. markets, Eric. But on that note, let's also get in some opinion from experts on the road ahead for the U.S. market.
We have a sound economy, even globally. We're fortunate to have low inflation this late into an economic uh, recovery cycle. And typically, again, if we had high and rising inflation, it would show that we're living beyond our means. Uh, we need to have a retrenchment. You don't see that. But we have binary risks around policy. Uh, the Federal Reserve was one thing that knocked the American economy down last year. It presented a risk to the world, but the other thing uh, is still very much unresolved, and that's trade sector risks. And that can be a very big issue for financial markets, for corporate profits, if not for economic performance. The bond market is predicting Fed easing, and it's an open question again as to what it takes now for the Federal Reserve to change its tune in terms of monetary policy. Uh, Fed Chairman Powell uh, said that it could be preventive medicine Right when asked about a 50 basis point easing uh, at the coming meeting at the end of July. So it's very plausible, again, that the Fed's whole reaction function has been uh, to ease almost regardless of how the data unfold. Fed might be just telling us here that they're going to act on the fact that inflation's exceptionally low. Bond market, you know, 2% 10 year yield um, in a 3% economy. Yields have come down over 100 basis points over the past, you know, nine months or so. Uh, clearly, the bond market is, is getting priced for a recession, but I think what it is saying more is uh, it's telling the Fed that it needs to cut. And of course, since last week's FOMC meeting, the Fed is basically saying, we hear you loud and clear. And there's even some, some talk about maybe a 50 basis point cut in July. Um, but you know, the market is pricing in three rate cuts. Low interest rates do as it increases valuations. So if we think about the cash flow of all these companies or bonds, bonds in, in general, um, you end up discounting those cash flows at a lower interest rate, which increases the present value. So that's all the technical jargon to say that's why prices are up so high right now, because rates are so low. Sure. Now, the issue, though, is that these are insurance rate cuts that the Fed is talking about, which means that these rate cuts are designed to stave off a recession. So not only are rates low, but they're also telling you that we're going to reduce the probability of a recession going forward, which means default risk in corporate bonds goes down. Well, in turning attention to the European markets, most markets, they ended lower. But the FTSE, that was a relative outperformer. That managed to end, end mildly in the green in yesterday's trading session. Now, investors, they're focusing on a couple of big cues. One is the geopolitical tensions between the United States and Iran. And the second big cue, and the big focus will remain, the upcoming G20 summit, where they're hoping that President Trump and Xi, that's Chinese Premier Xi, can come to a you know, meeting point and then resolve some part of that trade dispute as well. But besides the equity markets, oil prices continue to remain in focus. Now, this after, United States has imposed fresh sanctions on Iran, with Washington upping the ante of Tehran after downing off an unmanned drone last week itself. Now, President Trump has signed an executive order that goes after Iran's supreme leader and other top officials for the hostile conduct in the Gulf. The sanctions would deny them key financial resources and support. The Trump administration basically is hoping that the move will force Iran back to talks. The supreme leader of Iran is one who ultimately is responsible for the hostile conduct of the regime. He's respected within his country. His office oversees the regime's most brutal instruments, including the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. We will continue to increase pressure on Tehran until the regime abandons its dangerous activities and its aspirations. If they want to come back to the negotiating table, he's ready. If not, they won't. Uh, for people who say these are just symbolic, that's not the case at all. Uh, we've literally locked up tens and tens of billions of dollars. Uh, these sanctions will come along with additional entities where people are hiding money. All right, so that was the word from Donald Trump and Steve Mnuchin. They are saying that they are still open to negotiation, but they will continue to exert pressure on Tehran. Meanwhile, Iran's ambassador to the United Nations rejected the notion that there could be any talks while it was under the threat of sanctions, as he accused the U.S. of disregarding global cues. The U.S. decision today to impose more sanctions against Iran is yet another indication of continued U.S. hostility against the Iranian people and their leaders, and that the U.S. has no respect for international law and order, as well as the views of overwhelming majority 
of the international community. To ease tensions in the broader Persian Gulf region, the U.S. must stop its military adventurism in our region, as well as its economic war and terrorism against the Iranian people. There is also a need for a genuine regional dialogue on regional security. All right. Back home on the last street, it was a volatile trading day, which uh, ended with minor losses. The Nifty gave up the 11,700 mark, while the Sensex managed to hold on to the 39,000 mark. The broader markets, though, they fell in line with the benchmarks. The mid-cap index ended a quarter of a percent lower, while the Nifty Bank ended more or less flattish in yesterday's trading session. Anisha joins us early this morning to fill us in with all the cues. Hey, Anisha, good morning. Hi, Nigel. Good morning. Well, yes, you mentioned that the Nifty Bank ended at the you know flat line, but if you look at the intraday move, the Nifty Bank ended around 180 points off the day's high, and that is telling you the volatile session that we had in trade yesterday. As you mentioned, yes, the Nifty managed to just close around at 11,700 mark, but that too is 50 points off the day's high. Other than that, the mid caps continue to underperform and quite a bit because yesterday as well we saw a decline of around three tenths of a percent on the mid cap space while the headline indices ended flat or down about two tenths of a percent if you look at the buy figure coming in from the institutional side yes there's a net institutional buy both from the fii's and the dii's but the data is a bit skewed on account of the one big block deal that we had seen on account of imami so for example for Ima uh, for fii's we have seen a net buy figure of around 210 crores and the dii's bought in around 980 crores but as i mentioned there was a block deal of around 1230 crores on imami counter and that was uh, you know taken up by most of the dii's and that's the reason we are seeing that big bump up when it comes to the dii numbers other than that when you're trying to take cues from the global markets they are actually a tad bit mixed because us also ended pretty much around the flat line there were no major cues as you can see the dow ended in the green but the nasdaq and the s p ended in the red telling you that there's a bit of lack of conviction and direction in the markets and they're actually waiting by for the g20 summit which will happen at the later end of the week. In fact, at the G20 meeting, of course, President Donald Trump and Chinese Premier Xi Jinping are expected to meet and talk about the trade issues, and that will be the key important thing to watch out for. But ahead of that, Chinese Vice Premier uh, yesterday had a phone call with U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, and that too ha uh, had an impact on the markets. Separately, U.S. has also imposed some sanctions on Iran, and that is why there was a bit of nervousness in the markets yesterday. But other than that, the Indian markets have been starkly underperforming the global markets while nifty is YTD up around 8% the likes of Nasdaq as well as Shanghai composite are up over 22% for the Indian markets locally we have to watch out for the uh, some uh, watch out for the meeting with uh, US uh, representative Mike Pompeo who is visiting India from today and separately as you guys were talking about monsoon has been quite deficit this month down about 30 37% from the normal rainfall and that will remain important Asia this morning is not giving much cues but SJX nifty is suggesting an uptick of around 10 to 15 points so we'll watch out how we start off the trade and carry forward from there all right thanks a lot for that anisha but also tell us what are the stocks that we should watch out for in today's session well a couple of OFS coming pavitra and that is why we'll watch out for that so lnt tech for example when lnt is looking to sell two lakh shares of the company and the floor price has been set at around 1650 so we'll keep an eye out on that sbi life is also in focus because bnp paribas there is looking to sell up to 25 million shares of the company and there the floor price is around 650 so might see a bit of movement on that counter on account of that Separately, TCS is upping its stake in the Japanese arm by 15% and they are going to pay $33 million for that. So keep an eye out on that because IT yesterday was uh, largely in the red territory and Infosys as well has partnered with Toyota for some of the digital services. So keep an eye out on that. Other than that, the important news coming in for Piramal Enterprises as well as Sriram Group, wherein Piramal Enterprises is mulling selling entire stake in Sriram Capital. Remember, as of now, they hold around 20% so this will be important news to really keep an eye out on. Suzlon Energy, there have been a lot of talks and to and fro regarding deals. They say that they are uh, continuously mulling options of uh, you know raising capital. Let's see what comes out of that. Aeris Life is looking to uh, mull a buyback and that will happen on July 3rd. Syndicate Bank is looking to raise some capital for FY20 and that board meet is on June 29th. Andhra Bank has also taken an approval to raise around 2,000 odd crores. Wellspun Corp, there was a meeting of the 
buyback committee and they have decided that they'll buy back up to around 390 crore rupees um, worth of uh, equity the buyback price is 135 the record date is july 5th a lot of equity changing had we have been seeing a lot of block deals of late uh, expect for some kind of this deal happening on natco pharma as well because seven percent equity is expected to change hand there uh, might not happen through the exchanges because this is just between related parties so let's see how that pans out suntech realty has issued commercial paper of 35 crores important news because in this kind of market liquidity squeezes there the company has been able to garner that 35 crores and the rating has been positive other than that gmr has pledged more shares so maybe a bit of sentiment down tick there and there have been some movements with lic selling stake in a couple of these companies like axis bank bhl and uh, ifci so we'll keep it under all of these counters Okay, all right. Uh, now, one big so worry for the market has been the slow onset of the monsoon, which is crucial for agriculture and the overall economy. The Med Department now tells us that rainfall across India has been 37% below normal for this month so far versus the 44% last week. Now, the Med Department also adds that eastern and southern India have been covered by the monsoons and conditions are now favorable for the rains to advance into central and western India in this week. However, the deficit has impacted sowing patterns for certain crops across the country. So sowing for crops like cotton, rice, soybean, corn and pulses, all of them have been delayed by around a fortnight. Here's GP Sharma of SkyMet on what we can expect in the next few days and weeks as far as the monsoons are concerned. The uh, uh, monsoon definitely has uh, picked up a uh, pace in the last four, three, four days. And uh, that's how the deficiency has dropped now from 44% to about 37 today. Uh, but then uh, 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 it, it, it's going to go a little weak again after about 24 hours or so. Mm -hmm. Once again, from about the uh, 1st of July or so, fresh system is likely to form. Mm -hmm. And that should give us further rains. Climate had issued an advisory to delay the sowing by at least about a fortnight or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we have advised that with this spell of rain, which was there in the last about three to four days, wherein monsoon has now covered the more than 50% of the country. Well, auto dealers across the country, they are struggling. Not only are sales not showing any sign of revival, access to funding as well is drying up. CNBC TV 18's Alisha Sachdev and Arundhati Ramanan report that worries are mounting since these conditions are not likely to improve anytime soon. Auto sales have dropped for the 10th month in a row. Passenger vehicle sales were down 20.5% in May, the sharpest decline in 18 years, and commercial vehicle sales have dropped 10.74% year-on-year. This is pushing dealerships across the country into a corner because inventories are rising and with it, costs. Dealers are not able to get credit as easily as before, and that is a double whammy. Earlier, the dealer community used to enjoy a lot of uh, unsecured funding and they used to uh, get access to a lot of funds which currently due to a lot of reasons across the last one year I believe have become more stringent across the industry we've seen a pullback from finance companies so which uh, has affected the dealer liquidity situation. Uh, financing definitely is becoming a challenge and uh, I think NBFC's banks both are becoming uh, very risk uh, sensitive. Uh, so I think dealers have been asked to give collaterals even for uh, inventory funding. The pain doesn't end there. Falling real estate prices have meant that banks are revaluating re old collateral, meaning dealers are not getting as much money for their assets as they once were. Things probably won't get easier anytime soon. So dealership, yes, some risk aversion, aversion has happened in last six months. Yeah. And that may continue for some time. Yeah. So wholesale or dealer finance book, if we, if we are talking about, mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm not saying it's a liquidity issue, okay? But uh, it's a more of a uh, banks have become a bit cautious so far as uh, that particular uh, space is concerned. Rising funding costs and lackluster business has already pushed several dealerships to down shutters. As many as ten dealerships have gone out of business in the Delhi NCR region alone. Even offers for an extended interest-free loan to fund inventory like the one Maruti's learned to have offered its dealers are not helping much. Because since April, inventory levels have crossed 40 days for cars and 60 days for two-wheelers. 
for some auto dealers, unsold vehicles have piled up to such an extent that they're looking to buy or rent additional land just to park them. Now, there has been some relief with major car makers like m and Maruti Suzuki and Hyundai rejigging production schedules. But until real demand picks up again to enter the fast lane, this is only just a bandage and not a cure. In Mumbai, Alicia Sachdev. Right, by like the Parliamentary it. Committee on Black Money highlights that it has no definite answer on the amount of unaccounted wealth generated within and outside India. Now, the report says that the absence of a uniform definition on unaccounted income, coupled with a lack of accurate estimation method, makes it impossible to credibly estimate the amount of black money generated within and outside India. Kevin Lee joins us now with more from that report. Kevin, what else does the committee highlight? Well, it's a bit of an existential question, isn't it? Before you can account for how much black money there is in India, the first question you really need to answer is what is black money? And this is what that committee has been struggling with. They've said that there's no uniform definition of what black money or unaccounted income is in the economy. While they agree with the NIFM's definition of what unaccounted income is, they're saying it's different from black wealth because this income gets saved, it gets invested, it gets laundered. So how do you really quantify the amount of black money in the economy? They've said that a reliable estimation of unaccounted income and wealth is a difficult task and they've studied estimates done by three institutes. These institutes are the NIPFP, the NIFM, as well as the NCAER. And the CEA has said that there is no scope to combine these three estimates to derive an average. But what they have found is that there's a huge variation in even these three bodies' estimations of what unaccounted income or black money is. And the estimates range from 7% of the GDP all the way up to 120% of the GDP. So as you can see, that's a really wide margin over there. They've said that lack of consensus is also there about how best to calculate unaccounted wealth or black money. What they have identified, however, is sectors which are more prone to black money generation, sectors that you're seeing on your screen, the usual suspects, they're real estate, mining, Pharma, pharma, pan masala, gutka, tobacco, bullion and commodity, the film industry, educational institutes. So all of these places are prone to black money generation and hoarding. They've also talked about what the government has done to tackle the menace. So they've said that while the government has taken proactive steps to create a legal framework to prevent the gathering of black money, they've also said that the enactment of acts such as GST, the Fugitive Economic Offenders Bill, and amendments of FATCA and the IT Act are major steps. They've also expanded the ambit of TDS provisions and made PAN mandatory for certain things. Uh, speaking about black money that's stored outside of India, they have said that there is a greater need to integrate with global efforts that are already existing and tackling black money. And also, there need to be measures to reduce cash transactions. The SIT on black money that you were mentioning has submitted seven reports to the Supreme Court already. Now, what's the future strategy as far as the committee is concerned? Well, they've said that they expect the finance ministry to continue its efforts to combat this black money men menace. They've said that the finance ministry should follow up on those seven SIT reports that have been presented and that the direct taxes code should be finalized at the earliest to prevent new black money from being formed in the economy. They've said that the committee will formulate detailed recommendations. Remember, this is a preliminary report. The detailed rec uh, recommendations will come after examination of the evidence. And in the meanwhile, the finance ministry should furnish replies of what action is being taken to the standing committee within three months. So they have done some work but it seems like they're still struggling with that existential question of what is black money. All right, thanks a lot for that, Kevin. Uh, let's also shift focus on, to some stock-specific action now. Imami's shares nosedived in trade over 7% yesterday on the back of news that its promoters had sold 10% stake in the company. Mangalam is now here to tell us what brokerages are now saying about the stock. Good morning, Mangalam. Good morning. So absolutely, the promoters sold 10% yesterday. The management joined us and said, uh, uh, confirmed the same. And then thereafter, the exchange uh, disclosures came in there too. The promoters did say that there was a bunch of domestic and uh, uh, foreign fr funds who bought it, or rather most of them were domestic. The buyers uh, that were revealed were just SBI. They bought about a third of what the promoter sold, so 3% purchase by SBI. The remainder still needs to be known. More importantly, uh, City has written on it. They've cut the target price. They've taken a sharp ta uh, target price cut from 430 plus to around 340 because they believe now the focus shifts to the promoter group leverage concerns. The management said to us that the remainder of debt on their group at their group level is close to around 2200 odd crores. Uh, City believes that going 
forward, the company can go ahead and deleverage some of their cement assets, some of their real estate assets and their hospital business as well, for which they believe the timeline could be next six to eight months. A rather optimistic timeline, but let's see how that pans out. In terms of valuations, remember the stock has corrected around 50-55% from the peak and current valuations at 20 times are a 40% discount to the sector and for the company itself at a multi-year low. However, City would only be positive once there is some further news coming in on group deleveraging plans and that is the only thing that could aid re-rating for the company. While they have taken a sharp target price cut, they remain positive on the stock. Let's see where this pans out because the last time the promoters sold that 10% stake, what happened was the street gave it a longer rope. The stock started moving higher from the next day onwards. But within three months, the promoters had to sell another 10% as well. So let's see how this uh, pans out. The street is on a wait and watch mode. Let's also hear out what the management had to say to us yesterday, actually. We have sold uh, about 10% today. This has been sold by the promoters. This is primarily to reduce our debt. Uh, this would go entirely in reducing the debt. The buyers have been some of the market investors, both domestic and uh, foreign institutional investors. This is absolutely the last tranche. Uh, the idea is uh, definitely to reduce our debt, but after this we would be in a very, very safe position. I don't think we would need to dilute any further stake in Imami Limited. Total debt, uh, as far as the promoter debt is concerned, our debt was almost uh, 3,300 crores. After this take sale, uh, we would further reduce it down to about uh, 2,200 crores. And uh, our idea is to further reduce the debt in the next uh, coming months. We want to absolutely reduce uh, it to negligible levels. After repaying our uh, <coughs> debt, the pledge would come down to almost uh, 37%. Well, time to slip into a short break. Up next, an exclusive conversation with the top team at Pidilite. Stay Welcome tuned. Welcome back. Let's get straight on to an interesting conversation. As Pidilite celebrates 60 years of success, Shireen Bhan caught up with the minds behind the Indian adhesive giant Fevicol. Chairman M.B. Parekh, M.D. Bharat Puri and adman Piyush Pandey and began by asking them about the story behind the iconic brand. Piyush Pandey, uh, you know, the Fevicol story is so much also the brand story, so much about the kind of communication that O&M created. Uh, you didn't start with creating the Fevicol story, but you've been an integral part of the Fevicol story. Uh, one agency that's worked on this pretty much since inception. I, I came into the picture only around the late 80s on the creative side. Right. And... Uh, I was actually asked to work on this brand by my seniors who said, uh, give him all the Indian type boring brands. Indian type brands. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, probably what I call it now, huh. uh, I must have felt that way, that B2B is not boring to boring. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, um, and I found some very receptive, very down to earth, very focused people huh. on the pit light side. And I, I think they gave me the license to fly. Mm. And, uh, so what was the brief to you? Uh, you know, I mean, as I pointed out at the start, this is not, this is nothing to do with the sexy world of FMCG that Bharat Puri gave up on to, to join Pity Light. Uh, you know, this is not something that you can eat, wear, show off, brag about. Yet, it is one of the most iconic, memorable brands in India. I, I think uh, the first brief was actually about a radio spot for a brand called Fevi Tight, mm. uh, which has got two of the tubes huh. and I went and made a radio spot. They loved the radio spot and they said, why didn't you make a film of it? I made a film for very tight. Mm. And then when I showed the film, um, I was very nervous because everyone first clapped and then said there is a problem. And then his father, Mr. B.K. Parik said to me, you know, Piyush, there's a problem. This idea is too big for a small brand like very tight to give it, do justice to it. Huh take the money and go and make it again for Fevicol. And rest is history. Mr. Parekh, I, I want to put that question to you. Uh, you know, part of the Fevicol story and the Pity Light story now uh, is also about what you're doing on the inorganic side, what you're doing on the joint venture side. So uh, how is that tying in with the fact that you've been able to create this iconic Indian brand that has resonance? Uh, I mean, you know, who, who would have ever imagined that Prime Minister Modi uh, would, in his meeting with 
the Japanese Prime Minister post that meeting talk about the fact that the bond we share is stronger than that of Pevi Kaul. I mean, who would have thought that Pevi Kaul would have made it into a Prime Ministerial speech? Yeah, that's amazing, yes. So, so how know, much of what we can now see as far as the future is going to be about global growth, about global markets, about acquisitions, about joint ventures? No, we see in the process of identifying opportunities, uh, sometimes the, we find uh, segments where we believe that we should be there as a pioneer, mm. but we don't have the technology or the experience to do it in a short time. Mm. And now, compared to earlier, I think that things are moving faster. Right. And we can't take as much time with other products as we took with Fevicol. Mm. So therefore, we believe that we should spot uh, joint venture partners uh, and get on with moving into categories which are again falling into that pioneer, pioneer space. Pioneer, uh, yeah. Uh, space. Yeah. So Bharat Puri, let's talk a little bit about the pioneer category because that is what people who are looking at valuations are are, are keen to understand that uh, you know if it's priced in at this level, then what can we expect in terms of future growth? So where do you really see the new areas of opportunity where you're not today that you expect to foray into the categories that you hope to want to grow further from here on? And how is it going to happen? Do you see a more aggressive push on the inorganic side? See, two things. One is, if you look at our portfolio, we broadly define our portfolio into three categories. Core categories, where we already have a market-leading position. We are largely growing the category via, you know, growth in the economy, mm. premiumization, innovation. So things like a Fevi call, a Fevi quick, high market shares, entrenched position. These we'd want to grow at one to two times GDP. Mm. We then have a set of growth categories where, frankly, we're competing against non-consumption. Mm. Take waterproofing. Seven out of ten homes in India have a waterproofing problem. Yeah. Three out of ten address it. There the job is frankly to make that three into six mm. rather than worry about the three who are doing it and try and get share mm. out of those three. Mm. Now there we obviously we must grow two to five times GDP. Yeah. And so whether it's that, whether it's e-capitalite, whether it's emerging India, Joe, these are all what we call growth categories. Mm. And very simply pioneer categories are tomorrow's growth categories. Mm. We just bought over India's largest floor coatings company, right. high-end floor yes. coating, it's called CP. Yeah. Now, CP is the provider of these high-end coatings, whether it be for parking mm. lots, factory floors. But we're also excited. Shireen, we see this as an opportunity. Take a city like Mumbai, restaurants, hotels, hospitals, mm. all of them currently are using tiling as floors, and mm. that's frankly not a recommended solution. Again, it's a pioneer opportunity. It will take us a number of years, okay. but it fits into our model. Okay. Like this, whether it's this, whether it's style adhesives, mm. we have a whole range of pioneer categories. Obviously, some of them are confidential. Mm. But over time, we'd like our portfolio to be half core and half pioneer plus growth. Well, well crude oil prices continue to be in focus. Gold is at a multi-year high. And in fact, the Bitcoin out of nowhere has seen a massive recovery to more than ten to $11,000. Manisha Gupta joins us early this morning to give us a quick update on the commodity space. Morning, Manisha. Morning, Nigel. Thank you so much. Well, yes, the crude oil prices continue to be in focus. We did see uh, the prices come off its highs as the markets continue to focus on a lot of things. The U.S. sanctions on Iran leadership is one thing that is into the prices already. Markets gained had run up uh, ahead of this event. Also, it is going to be about the G20 summit in this uh, uh, this week itself. The expectations are quite high that the U.S. and China will be able to sort the trade dispute. The other thing is the U.S. weekly inventories, where the markets are anticipating a buildup in inventories, and that seems to be slightly uh, uh, weighing onto the sentiment. And the other thing, uh, the most important factor, has been the currency play. You have seen the U.S. dollar index trade at a three-month lows, and that has been supportive for many of these commodities, including crude. When it comes to the metal prices, well, we have seen some bit of a profit taking here. The U.S. manufacturing data services sector numbers are not exact, exactly very positive, and that's weighing onto the markets. So there's only one factor for all of base metal sector, and that really is the G20 summit. If nothing comes out of that, you perhaps are looking at yet another round of profit taking there. In the meanwhile, the only a few things that are holding firm in this market are the safe havens. The Japanese yen is trading at a five-month highs. The gold prices are trading at a six-year highs. 
And as you mentioned, the cryptocurrencies have seen a surge as well on back of financial and geopolitical tensions. So, yes, we are looking at a near 200 percent of a gain in case of Bitcoin in 2019 till time. All right. Thanks a lot for running us through all of those updates from the commodity space, Manisha. Let's also take a look at the FNO space now. And Manglam is standing by to take us through all of the queues. Manglam. Good morning. So yesterday, you know, was a range bound session for the Nifty and uh, we saw it end closer to that 11,700 mark. And that's an important level because it's perilously close to the 50 day moving average of 11,690. So let's see whether we take support there or not. The higher end, it's the 11, uh, uh, 11,860 mark, which is the 20 day moving average, which the street will be watching out for. Importantly, the FII's they bought in cash market after a fair amount of selling over the last few trading sessions. The domestic institutional investors also pumped in some money, but that remember has been on account of uh, uh, on account of the imami large trade the fii purchase also came on very very low gross volumes and index futures the data points are all over the place given the fact that this is expiry week so there was a, a mild bit of purchase in index futures a bit of selling in index options and in index options as well both long calls and long puts added by the fii's to the tune of around four to five thousand contracts similar amount of uh, uh, puts and calls sold by the fii so that's telling you maybe the markets are likely to be in, in a range with a fair amount of choppiness. But currently, the lower end of the range is where we are at. In terms of active options, 11,750 call as well as the 11,800 call came in for a fair amount of writing. And if you adjust the premium, it turns out to be that the 20-day moving average could be a bit of a hurdle. At the same time, on the lower end of things, uh, 11,700 to 11, 11,650 to 11,700 looks like a place of protection. In terms of stocks, watch out for Adani Power after a sharp surge yesterday entered the FNO ban and Gen Irrigation. Remember, three four days into uh, uh, after three four days, the stock will be excluded from FNO. But before that, it has exited the FNO ban. So let's see how that stock pans out too. Okay, all right, Mangalam. Uh, thanks so much for that. Well, on that note, we'll wrap up on Power Breakfast. You stay with us. Pass our morning call comes up next.